Amen. So I want to ask you a question. If you were an animal, what would you be? My kids ask me this question at least once a week. So I want to hear, what, what would you be, Cook? Silverback, baby. A silverback gorilla. <laughs> the rest of today, you got to walk around like a gorilla. <laughs> How about you, Cap? What would you be? Sea turtle. <laughs> Kate, what would you be? A golden retriever, so cute. And all the ladies said, aww. Somebody in the nosebleeds, what would you be? A penguin? I just went to the zoo with my kids last week and I said that was the favorite thing I saw. Yeah. That's the swag walk right there. You got to walk out like a penguin today. I, I, do you want to know what I would be? It's, it's one of two. It's either a lion or an eagle. Ooh, come on. Lion or eagle. Wouldn't that be awesome to just be an animal for a day? I think it'd be kind of, kind of cool. Um, how many of you know that, that God actually has something to say about this. He actually compares uh, you and I to an animal in the Bible. I hate to break it to you, but he calls you and I sheep. Meh. Meh. Give me your best one. Come on. Meh. Meh. We're a bunch of sheep, man. I know I, know I just killed some of y'all's confidence. I don't know whether to say I'm sorry or you're welcome because your head is actually going to fit through the door when you walk out today now. <laughs> yeah, don't elbow your husband right now. Don't do it. But isn't it true? There's something so funny about sheep. I mean, when you start to think about sheep, I mean, why are we like, why does God compare us to sheep? Have you ever thought that? You start looking into it and you start to realize that, that sheep, they're, they're directionless. Isn't that funny? Without a shepherd, like they don't know where they're going. Can anybody relate? Oh, I see y'all shaking your head. No. Well, here, you might be a sheep if you have to use Google Maps to go to your gym. I just called some of y'all out. You live in Omaha and you need Google Maps to get you going in the right direction you might be a sheep. Um, sheep also follow blindly. I was reading about sheep. There was this farmer who had all these sheep in the barn, and he put out this, um, this rope outside the barn door. And then he opened the barn door open, and the first two sheep jumped over the rope. And then after the first two jumped over, he cut the rope, and the rest of the herd kept jumping Yeah, I just gave revela a revelation to those of you with teenagers. Sorry to call y'all out, but the blind leading the blind. Well, actually, let me just speak this word to the next generation. The atmosphere you permit decides the product you produce. You're becoming like the people that you roll with, that you hang around. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. God has something special on you. You better check your circle. We're sheep. Uh, sheep also wander. I think I kind of alluded to this. With, without a shepherd, they just wander off their own way. Can anybody relate to that? I mean, I, I've done some wandering in my, in my life. And um, speaking of this idea of wandering, we, we have a wandering sheep in our household right now. I took a picture of him this week, and they're going to put it on the screen for you. Like, check, check out this... <laughs> This is my wandering sheep. Listen, my children are going to have to fresh start me when they get older because the amount of times that I use them in sermon illustrations, but it's just too good. This is my wandering sheep. Everybody say hi to Royce. 
Doesn't he just look like a sheep? I mean, come on. My man. Here's the deal, though. He's not wandering to green pastures. He's been wandering to our pantry. So here's the deal. This man is on a hunt. Lately, I'm telling you, there's, I could give you like four or five episodes. I think I could preach on this the whole time. It started getting so good that I had to start capturing all the times that I caught him sneaking into the pantry. Look, there's evidence. You guys think he's cute. They're gonna throw a, a, a picture on the screen here. Listen, the homie is strategic though. So the first picture over here, I caught him in the pantry and, and he kept hiding, a, he had a chip in his hand and it was behind his back. I'm like, what you got in your hand? Look at him, he looks so sad. Everybody say, "Oh." But look at how strategic the guy is. That, that picture of him standing on his little motorcycle there, do you see the cake right above him? I turned around, I said, what are you doing, Royce? He said, nothing, cake all over his face. There was one time, so he, now he's getting real strategic and he shuts the door, so when I see the pantry door shut, so the other day I go up to it and I knock, I say, who's in there? Silence. Hey, is anybody in there? All of a sudden I hear, no. <laughs> you just ratted on yourself, my man. Sheep, man. Here's the thing that I've realized, though. So this is, this is all fun and games, and it's funny. Royce uh, wandering to the pantry. I started to think about this, though, because I've been capturing this along the way, because I'm like, man, this is preachable. And then the Lord said, yeah, there's a bunch of you that are just like Royce. You're just better at covering it up. I was like, man, ooh, that hurts. Jeez. Man, ah, that stings, and it's so true, though. I catch myself wandering. I catch myself trying to do my own thing. It's like there's so much liberty, freedom, peace, joy, comfort that is ushered into our hearts when you and I submit to the shepherd, when we let him lead, when we get out of the driver's seat and we hop into the passenger side. There is something about life that just works. But how many of you know we like to hop back into the driver's side, don't we? Can anybody relate to, to what we're talking about? And you're probably like, okay, why are you trying to hammer home this point of, of, of us being sheeps? We get it. Move on. I'm a sheep. Bah. Bah. Come on. Bah. 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 But here's what I feel like I, I need us to understand before we get into this, 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 this chapter in Psalms is this. We have to first recognize that we're a sheep before we'll realize our need to follow a shepherd. You and I will not begin following the shepherd until we first have the revelation that we're a sheep. So many of us are in denial of that reality and we wonder why we're following blindly. We wonder why we're falling off cliffs. We wonder why we're doing stupid stuff. It's because God created us to be led by him to do life his way, his way. His way is the best way. Do you believe it in this place today? So let's check it out because Psalm chapter 23 just lays out so beautifully the life that Jesus has for us. He is our great shepherd. Let's check it out. Psalm chapter 23. It says this. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I just thought it was so interesting that David is relating the Lord to being his shepherd, this metaphor that he's setting up for you and I. He says, I have all that I need. Come on now, he's Jehovah Jireh. He's God our provider. Can we be content with what he's provided? He lets me rest. Somebody needs to underline that, star that. He's actually giving you permission to rest in green meadows. 
He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Oh, doesn't that just feel like sweetness in your soul? It's like honey to our mouth. Come on, somebody. Isn't the word of God beautiful? This is the life that he has for you and I. This is what he desires for us to be walking in. And the first point that I wanna leave with us this morning is this, the shepherd's presence leads to peace. See, I think it's so interesting that the first line says that the Lord is my shepherd. See, in this day and age, a shepherd was expected to lead the sheep, protect the sheep, heal the sheep, and then rescue the lost sheep. This relationship between a shepherd and his sheep is so interesting as you study it. I was even watching videos as I prepared for this week and it was so interesting that there was this group of sheep out in a field and all these people tried calling the sheep but as soon as the shepherd called the sheep, all the sheep came running to him. See, a shepherd knows his sheep and a sheep knows his shepherd. It's like peanut butter and jelly, baby. Yeah. We were designed to walk in proximity and closeness and relationship and intimacy with our great shepherd. Does anybody believe that in this place today? But the question that I want us to ask today is this, is can we say that this is true about our own life? See, the sweetest word in this psalm is the monosyllable my. He could have said that the Lord is our shepherd, The Lord is your shepherd, but he said the Lord is my shepherd. This is personalized. See, the Lord was his shepherd. And maybe this whole picture of a shepherd and his sheep isn't resonating in your heart, but maybe this will. I thought this was interesting, that the word for shepherd is taken from the the root word ra'ah, which is also the Hebrew word for best friend. So maybe you don't understand the relationship between a sheep and a shepherd, but you do understand the relationship between yourself and a best friend, that closeness, that proximity. What's interesting is Jesus actually invites us into this sort of relationship with him. In John chapter 15, he says this, I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. Here it is. No, I've named you friends. I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. Do you see this? this? What we're being invited into is this closeness, this intimacy, this proximity. David is laying out for us what a life surrendered to the great shepherd looks like. He says things like our needs will be met. There's rest for our soul. There's peace for our mind and heart. There's renewed strength. We're guided in the right direction and there's honor. Come on, somebody. Does anybody want to walk in that? That's the life that he's designed for you and I to live in if we will trust the shepherd. See, the sheep that goes wandering off on his own does not experience the same life that the sheep that follow the shepherd do. We need to recognize that if we're gonna experience the abundant life that Jesus promises us in the Gospels, we need to be willing to follow the great shepherd. The problem for so many of us is we wanna be in control. We want control. Especially when our life starts to unravel when we start walking through difficult circumstances, difficult seasons, problems, trials. Can anybody relate in here? Isn't it in those moments that we wanna take back control? It's like we're saying, hey God, thank you for this life that you've given me, I appreciate it, but I've got it from here. Can you relate? I like to put it this way, no God, N-O, no God, no, no God, no peace, No God, K-N-O-W, no God, no peace. We have to be willing to submit to his lordship because you can't experience peace, the peace of God, until you make peace with God. A sheep that is separated from his shepherd will not experience shalom 
and God's desire is for you and I to experience the peace of God. Not based on circumstances, but based on who he is, based on our relationship with him, based on proximity, closeness, intimacy. God provides this kind of life for us no matter what we're walking through. And maybe you're in this place today and you feel like you haven't been able to rest. Could it be that you aren't able to rest because you aren't trusting? There's a connection between our resting and our trusting. Our level of trust is connected to our level of peace. I think rest feels like stress because busyness is how many of us self-medicate. Let me say that again if you didn't catch it. Rest can feel like stress if busyness is how you self-medicate. So many of us can't rest because we're trying to cover up what I like to call soul wounds. This rest has to start in our soul and then it enters into our mind and then it shows up into our hands. It's soul, mind, and body. This is the rest that our shepherd is inviting us into. And if you came into the house of God today tired and weary and feeling broken, you came to the right place because this is what Jesus says about your situation in Matthew chapter 11, 28 and 30. He says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Oh, come on. That's his invitation for you and I. You're saying, no, nah, he couldn't do that for me. Listen, some of y'all need to release, man. You need to let go. You need to stop trying to control the outcomes. You need to stop trying to figure it out. Every single day you and I wake up, we have a choice to make. We can turn to the world, we can turn to ourselves, or we can turn to our Savior, our King Jesus. And I can promise you there's only one that's gonna bring peace into your life. I understand there are practical measures that you and I need to take in our life, but the practical measures follow the most important measure, which is pressing into the grace of God, which is being fulfilled and satisfied in him and him alone. This is where the abundant life that David is talking about in this particular chapter, this is where it's experienced. This is where it's experienced. You and I, when we get close to God, this is when we experience the peace of God. Now, I want you to see a connection here because this is so good. I, I didn't give them this point, but I want, I want you to jot this down. The shepherd's presence leads to strengthening in verse three. It says it there. But, but I, I feel like I need to share this with somebody in here today. You can't be strengthened without sustenance. So, so I want to make this connection for you. So what is the sustenance for you and I? It's the word of God. You're like, oh my goodness, do you have anything new? No, I don't. It's just the facts. It's the truth. I want to say this though, but to be led by the shepherd is to be submitted to the scriptures. What are you submitted to in this season of your life? Huh? Are you submitted to your coach? Are you submitted to your teacher? Are you submitted to your boss? Some of you are submitted to Google. Bro, oh, you gotta go to you gotta go to God before you go to Google. Love the social media influencers that you follow, but they aren't the God that knows it all. We need to turn to Him. To be led by the Shepherd is to be submitted to the Scriptures. I believe this: the restoration and revival of your soul is coming when you saturate in the Scriptures. I want you to see this. Psalm nineteen, verse seven says this: "The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul." So check this out: that word in Psalm twenty-three, verse three, where it says "renewed strength." is the same word for reviving the soul in 19.7. Do you see the correlation that God is trying to get us to understand? 
These two words mean this, to revive, to give new life. Does anybody need to be revived and experience new life in the house of God today? It's going to happen when you and I get saturated in his word, in his presence. He wants to fulfill you and satisfy you and speak to you. And listen, you might not have the answers, but what if he's the answer? What if he actually wants to carry you in the midst of this battle and this trial? in this season, in this weariness, would we come to him? Would we trust him? We need his word. We need to press into his scriptures in this season. I love Psalm chapter one, verses two and three. It says this, after it says that we don't stand in the pathway of sinners, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like, here it is, trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Doesn't matter what we're walking through. Doesn't matter what our circumstances look like. We can bear fruit in each season. It says this, their leaves never wither and they prosper in all that they do. They prosper in all that they do. And this, this connects to the next section in Psalm chapter 23, verse four. It says this, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. The next point I want to make is that the shepherd's presence leads to protection. Protection. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, this valley that you've been in, and here's the, the thing about valleys that are interesting is, is valleys, it, it, you feel surrounded. And some of you just started walking in a valley. Some of you have been in a valley for a minute. And the question you're asking is, how much longer do I need to walk through this valley? I felt like the picture that the Lord shared with me this week is, some of you have been walking through a valley so long you feel so burnt out, frustrated, weary that you camped out in a place that you were supposed to walk through. You followed the shepherd into the valley, but at some point you set up tent in the valley and the shepherd kept moving towards green pastures. See, David says we're supposed to walk through, and it says that in the midst of the valley, he will be close to us. Now, here's the interesting thing as I think about this psalm is how many of you know that David is writing this in retrospect? Scholars submit that he actually wrote Psalm chapter 23 when he was a king. It's so interesting because for those of you that are new to the Bible, David started out as a little shepherd boy. So it's interesting, he, he experienced what it was like to be a shepherd. And it's, fun, it's so cool that he's drawing the correlation of the great shepherd to his experience as a shepherd watching over sheep. I mean, there's just so many parallels here that are mind-blowing. But there's so much power in this picture of looking back. In other words, as David is writing this and pinning this, he's reflecting on the valleys that he's walked through. I'll just bring one to you. There's many. Go study the life of David. First Samuel chapter 19. I love this. Supernatural protection from our Savior. Saul, King Saul, was the king on the throne. David was anointed king, but he was not yet king. Saul gets jealous of David and, and begins going after him, trying to take his life. In this particular chapter, he sends three groups of people to go and try to capture and kill David. And all three times, the people that he sent out run into Samuel and the rest of the prophets, and the Bible says that they ended up prophesying too. So prophecy, oftentimes in the Old Testament, was attached to predicting the future. What scholars say is that basically, as Saul sent these guys out to go capture David, they basically ran into a worship party and got caught up in the presence of God. The Holy Spirit fell upon them, and all they could do was lift praises to to Jehovah Yahweh. So Saul's all frustrated. He's like, all right, I'm going to go do it. 
this is one of the most hilarious sections of scripture. It says that Saul went, he ends up running into the same worship party. He ends up prophesying and praising God. And it says that he was stripped naked. Now, he wasn't standing bare naked. A lot of scholars submit that, that it, basically all of his royal garments were stripped off of him. It was as if God was saying, no, my hand is on David and I'm going to humble you right now. And the only thing you're going to be able to do is lift up praises to me. Check this out. Saul would have been fine if he would have just submitted to this. This is all God wanted from him. Do you see the supernatural protection of God on David's life? This is the same God that I'm talking about that is watching over your life, that is close beside you in the midst of the valley that you're walking through. And yesterday's test becomes today's testimony. And a testimony becomes a memorial. And when you and I look back on the faithfulness of God, the deliverance of God, the protection of God, we face our future test with confidence. It's so interesting, I was thinking about the principle of a memorial. This is something that we've lost in our current culture. I talked about it with our team last week, but in Joshua chapter four, go study it on your own. I don't have, I don't have time to break it down. But when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, God asked each tribe to go grab a rock, the rock representing what he did. It became a memorial. The purpose of this memorial was that when future generations saw these memorials, they would ask, and it would point to the faithfulness of God. You and I need some memorials in our life, memorials of God's deliverance and faithfulness in our life so that when we find ourselves in the midst of the valley, we can keep marching all the way through because we know who our God is. I was reminded of a memorial in my life. I have this rock at home that says all in, and it has the date 426, 2014. You're probably wondering, what in the world is that? 426, 2014, in the back of his house property where our 180 ministry is at right now, I got on my knee and I asked this beautiful girl in the front row to marry me. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I had this rock sitting there that said all in in the date. And that rock represents the moment that her and I decided that we're going on this journey forever. Now, I want you to understand this, that when I look at that rock, it represents so much more than just me getting on my knee in the back of his house. You have to understand here for a second. At 16 years old, I was scrolling through a message board and I saw a message board with my name on it. Young people, don't go read message boards. It's just a bunch of garbage. I click on it. And it was a bunch of high school kids making fun of me because of an interview that I did, and they were making fun of the lisp that I had. Now, it's interesting because the more and more that I speak, it's like subtly going away, but it's still there with certain words that I say. Here's what's so interesting. Before Jerrick and I came to together, she was in Costa Rica at YWAM. They had a speaker come in that said, hey, you should really begin to ask God to speak to you about characteristic and attributes of your future spouse. Like go get in the secret place and start journaling those things. She shared a wild story from her own life. And so Jerrica went, you know, in her prayer time and started journaling. And so she got to the end of the list of all the things that she desired in a husband. And she said, God, tell me one thing about my husband. She felt like she heard he's going to have a lisp. So she writes it down in her journal. A couple weeks later, a young man comes running to her from the prayer room and says, Jerrica, Jerrica, I just got a revelation of your husband. She's like, what in the world? This is weird. He's, he's going to be this like big, strong, athletic guy, but he's going to have this like soft heart, this gentle spirit. And she started describing this, or he started describing this guy. And then he runs out of the room and she's going to the Lord like, why in the world did you have this guy come share this with me? Like, this is kind of weird. And uh, she felt like the Holy Spirit whispered to her because his name is Michael Patrick. Just listen to me. The guy who came and shared the word with her, his name was Michael Patrick. So Jerrica walks away from Costa Rica 
with this is who I think my husband's gonna be, Michael Patrick with a lisp. Do y'all know my name? It's Michael Patrick, and your boy has a lisp. Okay, why am I telling you this story? Because this story represents so much more than a stone when I got on a knee. There's healing. There's freedom. There's, uh, her and I are walking through a dicey season, but we look back on this moment and we're like, without a shadow of a doubt, God called us together and we're gonna face this mountain and we're gonna keep marching because we serve a faithful God that's been with us, that was orchestrating this a long time ago. I wanna declare in this place today that God is with you, that he's protecting you, that he's walking with you. And I wanna leave us with this final point as we stand to our feet. It finishes th this way in Psalm 23. <laughs> It says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. We were just singing about the table that we're gonna be seated at in heaven. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I love this last part. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. The shepherd's presence leads to purpose. Two Mondays ago at 4.20 in the morning, God woke me up. And this doesn't happen often. But on this particular Monday morning, I woke up and God began to stir in my spirit. It was crazy because there was no sleep in my eyes and I couldn't grab paper fast enough. I typically write and journal like in a remarkable, but on this particular occasion, I had to grab pen and paper and I just started writing down what I felt like God was sharing with me. And I wanna leave you with this word because I think it connects to this idea of God being our great shepherd. But I felt like God was saying that we're entering into a season of divine acceleration. Divine acceleration. And then the second thing that the Holy Spirit whispered into my ear is that the multiplication is coming in your life through mentorship. This idea of mentorship is interesting because when I initially received this, this sort of vision and this word, I was thinking of mentorship, like I need a mentor, like PT or Kevin, I need, I need, I need a human mentor. And yes, I believe that the word is, a, is connected to that, but we need the great mentor. We need the great shepherd divine acceleration and multiplication into your life through the great shepherd. The next day I was reading John chapter six, where Jesus multiplies the five loaves of bread and the two fish. And here's what's interesting. Jesus receives this, this offering from this little boy. He thanks God for it, he blesses it, and then he puts it back into the disciples' hands. And it says that the multiplication came through the distribution. So here's the interesting thing. This isn't just for us to receive. Our purpose isn't just to receive and be a lake. It's actually you and I were designed to be rivers. We're called to receive from heaven and then give it away. Receive from heaven and then give it away. Come on, Jesus puts something in our hands and as we distribute it, it begins to multiply in our life. Do you believe the divine acceleration is coming into your life? Matthew 4, 19 and 20, Jesus called to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. They had to leave something to receive something. They had to leave something to learn something. We gotta let go of our pride so that we can step into our purpose. Our pride is what's delaying us. We gotta humble ourselves before the king. I love what Isaiah 53, six says. It says this, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Thought, word, and deed, we, we wander off the path that God has set for us and we start going down our own way. And here's the interesting thing that I've realized about 
this idea of following Jesus is it's not, it's not a one-time thing. This Thursday, I walked into a meeting and I had been going pretty hard for 12 days straight. Hadn't really taken great care of resting my body physically. And if I'm really honest, I didn't wanna show up. The reality is, is what was going on, on the inside is ultimately eventually gonna show up on the outside. And I was wearing it. But I love that I showed up to a group of people that love me enough to say, what's going on on the inside? I, I, see, I just see that, that you're wrestling, there's something. And it gave me an opportunity in a safe space to confess. The confession ushered in clarity. And here's what the clarity was, is I had taken control of the wheel. I was driving that particular wheel. And it's these moments of clarity that bring us back. So there's no condemnation in this place, whether you're a believer or you're not submitted to the Lord at all. We all have the propensity to drift in our life. Here's the good news. Friday was my Sabbath, and I'm telling you, wasn't it just incredible? God just did something so fresh in my heart as I got back into this posture of trusting. What did I say earlier? Your level of peace is connected to your level of trust. I don't know what you're walking through right now, but God does. And he's saying, trust me. And so we're gonna go into just a 